reminded by God's word that we're not fighting a carnal battle here. You know, we're not fighting against the tax man or the politicians or even our neighbors or our family. We're fighting, the Bible tells us, we're fighting, uh, we wrestle against not flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against principalities. We're wrestling against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That is our fight. That is what we're called to do. And you might hear those words and you might think, wow, that's overwhelming. How can I, a little person on this planet, be engaged in such a spiritual war? But you know, God has given us those answers in his word. God has given us the power to do so through his Holy Spirit. But one of the things that he truly reaches out to us this morning with is that he asks us to pray. He asks us to intercede on behalf of all of these things. And let me tell you, if you think that God doesn't care about the small things, you're mistaken. He cares about even the most intimate little things in our lives that we would think that the creator of the universe wouldn't even think about. But he cares about those things. He cares about, well, what's going on in the spirit realm. And he's given you and I the privilege to be a part of that. I know, and you probably know this morning, he doesn't need us, right? Don't you think he could get everything done he wants to get done without us being involved? We could just sit back and watch it all happen. But he gives us that privilege. He gives us that honor to participate in the process of victory, basically, is what we're talking about. So, you know, I just want to encourage you today. Yeah, people make a lot of New Year's resolutions. And uh, let's make, uh, let's resolve that we're going to be people of prayer this year. You know, um, Let's make that commitment in our hearts to not allow the things of the world to get in the way of the things of God. I know it's been a very busy, <laughs> to say the least, uh, holiday season. And, you know, it's kind of like, it's a race, isn't it? Those few weeks before Christmas comes and people are all running around and making plans to go here and to go there and you're out on the roads and you're trying to drive amongst the masses and you're in the stores trying to shop and people are everywhere. It's almost like a competition, you know, especially when you see people. <laughs> I've seen this. I don't know if you have or not. I've seen people literally having a tug of war over items in the stores. It's a competition. It's competitive. I need to get where I'm going. I need to get what I want. I need to get there first, you know. And that whole competitive mindset, that's something that is in each and every one of us. We all have that, that desire to compete, to win. Who wants to be a loser? I don't know of anybody. You know, we all want to see our lives enhanced. Paul, in writing in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 9, he said, Did you know that all of those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize? So run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in everything. We learn very early in our lives the meaning of victory. Many years ago when I was really young, Wild World of Sports was the big program that we would watch. And in the beginning, that's what they would say. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Well, we're always looking towards the thrill of victory and trying to avoid the agony of defeat even from very young age. You know, we have sibling rivalries. We have peer pressure. Kids fighting over toys. 
We get engaged in competitive sports. It's important to look the best and to have the most, to have that great personality, money, a job. That's just something that comes very natural to us as humans, to be competitive. We, we'll compete with anybody, friends, family, strangers, it doesn't matter. We'll focus on winning. If you've ever been on a sports team or anything like that, your coaches will always tell you, you never focus on losing. You're always focused on winning. It's ingrained into us. I have to win. I'll sacrifice. I'll prioritize. I'll focus. I'll do whatever it takes in order to win. And that's what Paul's talking about here in this particular passage in 1 Corinthians. He says, he says therefore, going on in the, in the passage, he says, Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. And I buffet my body, and I make it my slave. That little passage right there is filled with a lot of knowledge. Yeah, Paul must have been a sports fan. And you know, they had sports during Paul's time. They had all kinds of games that they would do, uh, equestrian events, uh, you know, all kinds of different things that would be going on. And, but Paul, not being an athlete himself, but he's, he's using this as an example for us because I know we're not all athletes in here, but the same principle that Paul's talking about here this morning applies to you and me in our Christian life. And that's the point he's trying to get across to us. He's comparing the Christian life to an athlete. And he tells us in there that an athlete in training would get rid of anything that would slow him down. That would mean clothing. That would mean diet. That would mean extra equipment. It would mean anything that might hinder his progress. It's got to go. And right away, anybody that's been in sports, or even those that aren't, we're competitive about our jobs. We're even competitive when we drive on the road. You ever get those people that just got to get in front of you? And you drive 50 miles, and they're just one car in front of you, and you're like, what was the point, right? <clears throat> but I had to be in front. We're competitive. Paul understood this principle. And while he's not talking about sports, he viewed it in this way. He understood, Paul did, that if he didn't sacrifice, if he didn't prioritize, if he didn't focus on his goal, then he was going to be prone to wander, to drift. And the Bible tells us that that's how we are. We are prone to drift. We're prone to wander. That's why the Bible calls Jesus the anchor of our soul. He keeps us where we need to be. He keeps us sure-footed. He keeps us planted where we need to be. And that's so, so important for us as Christians. We can wander in our relationships. We can wander in our relationship with Jesus. So he runs in such a way. What way? What, what's he talking about? Well, first of all, he says, as not without aim. In other words, I'm not just running blind. I'm not just running not knowing where I'm going without direction. I have a specific goal in mind, and I'm running towards it, and I'm not taking my eyes off of it until I get there. And secondly, he says, I box yeah, in a way where I'm not just beating the air. Now, I don't know if you've seen very many boxing matches or, you know, fights or anything like that, but they say that when you go to throw a punch and you miss your target, it uses a lot more energy to miss than it does to make contact. And so sometimes in people's lives, even in our lives sometimes, we find ourselves shadow boxing, if you will. We're not really hitting anything. We're just expending all of our energy as we swing away. We're beating the air, as he says here. And then thirdly, he says, I buffet my body. And I make it my slave. 
I think that we've learned through life that there's two options here. You make your body your slave, or you become a slave to the body and the things of the flesh. There's really no in-between. There's no gray area there. And Paul, he's, he's telling us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that all of these athletes, you know, every year when the Olympics come around, you hear how hard they train. All the events they have to go through, the discipline, the commitment that goes forth. For what? Well, back in Paul's day, they would give them this little wreath that they would put on their head. It was made out of flowers and plants, olive limbs or whatever. And in two weeks, it would dry up and be dead and gone. Glory is fleeting in the world, isn't it? It doesn't last. You can't remember from year to year who's the most valuable player in basketball last year. I don't have a clue. But at that moment in time when they achieve that goal, it it, it almost leaves them hungry, thirsty, empty, unfulfilled. Because the things of the world will never be able to fulfill the spiritual need that we have in us. Every single one of us. Believer or unbeliever, we all have that very same need. The problem is, we continue going to the wells of the world. We continue trying to drink from there. And Jesus told us in John 4, he said, whoever drinks of this water, speaking of the water of the world, will thirst again. You're going to have to keep coming back. Yeah, you won the championship, but now it's another season, and you got to start all over again. And the glories of yesterday fade very quickly. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst, because the water that I give him will be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So it's not like we just fill up with that water. It becomes a well that continually refills us. We call that the Holy Spirit. We call that having a personal relationship with God in our lives. And it's a never-ending well of living water. I know a lot of us know that the glory of this world at best is fleeting. You know, here's something I was thinking about. Most of us, we never become winners, right? But we keep trying, we keep hoping that maybe we will. And we do the same thing with God sometimes. Sometimes we think we will keep on trying to please God. And we keep on losing. We keep on coming short. Oh, some of us, we make it further than others. Some of us get further down the road than others. But ultimately, we all come short. That's what the Bible says. I'm not trying to judge us or anything. I'm just saying that's what the Word of God tells us. We all come short of the glory of God, no matter how hard we try. Some of us are running away from God, and that's a race that you will always lose, by the way. And it's true, being a Christian isn't easy. We can become very weary. We can lose focus. We we can't go on sometimes, we feel. We're at the end of our rope, and we get to a point sometimes in our lives where we're willing to try anything so that we can feel okay. That always takes us down a dark road, because there's a lot of voices out there, you guys, that are calling out, come this way, partake of this thing, attach yourself to this group, you know, you'll find fulfillment. It's the same old lie. It's the same lie that was told Jesus in the wilderness. Just bow down to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I mean, if you're hungry, just turn the rock into bread. We seem to be up against the very same temptations that the Lord was up against. And there are times in our Christian lives where even the walk of a Christian's become competitive. We have that edge to please God, but we come up short. 
And you know what? Here's the beautiful thing about this. Jesus knew that you and I were trying to run a race that we could never win. He knew that. The Father knew that. So he ran it for us. He ran that race. He finished the race. He had the ability to do what you and I could never do. And that's because he is perfect. He is spotless. He's the Lamb of God. He's our Savior. And he says to us in Matthew 11, he said, Come to me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And ultimately, I don't know, I would say, I would venture to say that most of us, we like the sound of that. We want some rest. As a matter of fact, one of the things about this competitiveness that we have naturally in all of us, another aspect of that is wanting to be in control of everything. Who doesn't want to be in control? You know, I'm, uh, I guess, an adrenaline junkie in a lot of ways. I, I like to do things that are crazy sometimes. Some of the things I've never been able to do. One of the things I'd like to do, especially with this movie that's been coming out, this uh, new uh, Top Gun movie that's out and everybody's watching, I want to fly one of those jets. <laughs> Man, that's what I want to do. How exciting to be in control of something like that. Or maybe driving a very fast car around a racetrack. My wife got to do that. How fast did you go? 129. Man, that's pretty good, babe. Or, or even for myself, to sit on top of some big, huge motor with only two wheels attached to it, right? Yeah. Those kind of things bring excitement to, our, to us in our lives. It, you know, honestly, it gives us a sense of power because we're in control of that. I like roller coasters. I like bungee jumping. I like going to get on one of those trams that takes you from the bottom of the desert all the way to the top of the mountain, and, and you're looking down at the rocks below you 300 feet, and you're just hanging from a little cable as you go up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That is an adrenaline rush. But you know, there's something different about that than there is being on the, in the car or in the jet or on the bike or whatever. Totally different. Because when I'm in that car and I'm going up that little cable right there, I have absolutely no control. Right? I have to put all my faith who is controlling that machine. And it's very, very cool to experience something like that until something goes wrong. Until the cable snaps. And you find yourself totally out of control. You have no control. That can happen a lot of ways in our lives. Being in control of everything in your life, I'm telling you right now, is a losing battle. There are some things that we can be in control of. But this can happen in so many ways. To be in control of everything in my life. And suddenly when I'm not, I begin to feel stressed. I start to unravel, if you will, and fear encompasses me. And I don't know what to do. I feel maybe like I'm in a free fall. And so it is in life, isn't it? People like control. I don't like to be controlled, do you? I like freedom. I like to make my own choices. And when I say that, I mean as far as things concerned in the world and in this life. There are many things, though, as much as we don't want to be controlled, there are many things that do control you and me. You know, the laws of the land, traffic laws, employers, customers, 
Sometimes things that are destructive to us can also control our lives. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, things like that, that we lose control. But when we come to Jesus, one of the things he asks us to do is to release control to him. And when we release control to a person, it requires a great deal of trust. It requires knowing the one that I'm giving control to every time. Some people around you, you know, may be controlling. Maybe you're controlling. Maybe it's just part of your personality. A spouse, a boss, a friend. And it's hard to deal with these people sometimes. It can be very ego-building for them and a very prideful thing. And while everybody's trying to be in control, the society that we live in, and the whole world, if you will, as we look around, seems to be getting more and more out of control, does it? That's what I'm seeing. I look around and it seems like everything is going upside down. It's inverted. It's like looking in your rear view mirror trying to read a sign on the road behind you and it's all backwards. Oh, by the way, you know that's why when you see an ambulance and it says ambulance in the front, it's spelled backwards. So when you look in your rear view mirror, you'll see the word ambulance because it's inverted, right? But it seems like the enemy has taken opportunity to invert so many things in our lives and in our world. And Jesus warned us about it. There are troubles everywhere in the world today. We were one of the very last strongholds to goodness. And now our country isn't much different than any other godless nation. Where do we go to to get a hold of that again? It wouldn't appear that it's very close by. It seems to me that most of the time when I look around, I'm thinking, oh, come quickly, Lord. You ever think that? I'm ready to go, Lord. And knowing that, you know, Jesus said it's going to get so bad that if he were not to come and those days be shortened, that no flesh would be saved. That's the pathway that the world is heading down. We're not going to fix it. The world's not going to fix it. The harder they try to fix it, the quicker they're sinking. Because they're trying to do it without God. They're trying to do it for the sake of power. And then I think about our future. How much are we really in control of our lives or our future? It seems to me like, for me anyway, my experience, it seems like when I'm having trials, we all have them, flat tire, when you're trying to get somewhere, you get up in the morning, your car won't start, money problems, difficult times at work, maybe things going on with our kids, Trouble with phones. <coughs> That's okay. I won't even look over there. I don't want to know. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. Something like that, okay, we can still be in control even though it doesn't go our way. We can fix the flat. We can work on getting the financial thing fixed. We can work on things that hands-on we can fix. But what about when things come up in our lives that you have no control over? That's when worry and anxiety begins to really creep in. It's like a terminal illness or a bad economy or watching a loved one go through addiction. These are the kind of trials that are out of our control. These are the kind of things we really can't affect change in. 
And yes, we're called to pray about these things. And we have to say, okay, Lord, I'm putting this in your hands today. Isaiah 54, verse 5 is a beautiful verse. It says, For thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. That's who we're related to. That's where we come from. That's where we're going because we're in the family. He is our husband. And in light of that and even knowing that myself, my own mind, I can actually invent things to worry about. You ever do that? How about the what ifs? Huh? It happens all the time, doesn't it? We fear the worst for a family member. You get a little pain in your chest and you think it's over. We fear the unknown because we don't know. These are the times, you guys. These are the times when God is teaching us to trust Him. Isaiah 51, 15, it says, But I am the Lord your God that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is His name. Who is in control? We all know that beautiful analogy that James gives us about a horse. Those of you who are horse people can really relate to that. On how we have this huge animal that we can put a small bit in its mouth and we can control the direction that animal's going to go. Fast, slow, backwards, forwards, around barrels, around a track. It doesn't matter. But what is necessary for that hat to happen, to take place? That animal has to be broken. That animal has to be submitted to its master. That animal has to trust its master. That it will have his best interest wherever he leads it. And when, the, when this beautiful combination comes together, they operate as one. Well, you know what? We as people are much the same. We need to allow our will to be conformed to His will. We can't just run amok out in the wild fields anymore. We need to come to that place in our lives where I'm willing to relinquish control of my life to God. Knowing that He's going to lead me down paths of righteousness that he will not only bring good things into my life, but he will bring me eternal life. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you might prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, this is one of my favorites. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. You believe that this morning? I do too. It really sounds like a simple principle on the surface, doesn't it? Just trust in the Lord. But there's one more element that I wanted to talk to you about. You know, we looked at a competitive spirit. We've looked at this whole idea of being in control. Those are all human things. But you know, I think that many times those human things in our lives can be redirected to bring glory to God. Maybe you're a real go-getter. Maybe you're a workaholic. Maybe for most of your life, your goals have been to get up into the, you know, seven-digit income, whatever. And then you come and you know Jesus, and he talks to you about those things, and he says, you know, you have all this drive, you have all this energy. Man, wouldn't you want to channel that into the things of God? Wouldn't you want to take that and channel it to bring glory to the Lord? I would say yes. But in any of these things that we're talking about, there's one thing that's very necessary that we have to have, and that's commitment. And that's mainly what I want to share with you this morning. It's New Year's Day. How many of you made a 
resolution. Don't raise your hands. Because if I ask you next week, no one will raise their hands, right? We always make resolutions. From a very young age, we make promises. From a very young age, we learn that we break promises. Thousands of them in our lifetimes we make. We make them to friends and family and businesses. We, we make commitments to cars, toys that we drive. Homes that we live in require a huge commitment. We associate ourselves with groups like our little church. We make commitment to the church. Maybe clubs, organizations. Probably the two biggest commitments in life that we make is marriage and our relationship to Jesus. Those are the, really the two biggies of all right there. But included, again, in these commitments is the willingness to surrender ourself. And it's no different when I make a commitment to God. I have to surrender myself to Him. I have to exercise faith in my relationship with Him so that we can grow in the Spirit. But you know, a commitment is only as good as the one making the commitment. And how many of us don't ask to confess today, but haven't every single one of us failed in some way or another in a commitment that we've made? Even if it's something little like, I'm going to make it to prayer meeting every Wednesday night. I'm going to commit to that. And then you don't make it. How do you feel? Well, you can feel defeated. You can feel frustrated. You can feel embarrassed. A lot of times we open our mouths and we go, I'm committing to that. And then we don't. And a lot of times, you know what it does? It brings shame and embarrassment. It causes us to shrink back and be afraid to make future commitments. Or the people around us will say, yeah, I've heard that before, you know. Here's the thing. I am really happy that my eternal life is not based on the level of my commitment, but it's based on the level of his commitment to you and me. That's what it's based upon. When he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished, done, signed, sealed, delivered. It's ours. I can't make it any better. That depth of commitment that he has to you and me will never change. This morning, that's where we sit <laughs> with excitement, hopefully, looking forward into this next new year. I've always been kind of baffled by this whole New Year's thing because it's just another day. But we set it aside and we, and we use it as a very important tool to say, yeah, last year was bad, it was rough or whatever. I'm going to erase it now and I have a brand new opportunity to start with a fresh slate. New Year's Day. When you look at it on the surface, it's just another day. You know, last night, that really hit me because we were watching the, a couple of the uh, New Year's things on the news. And you know, like in Australia, it happens like 12 hours before it happens here. And so you're seeing all these different locations around the world where they're already celebrating New Year's, and it's now in the past for them. But for us here, we're still waiting for it to happen. That's really weird, don't you think? You'd think the whole world would all do it at the same time, no matter what time it is anywhere. But that's not how it happens. That tells me something about time. Time isn't something you can truly nail down. Time keeps on slipping into the future. <laughs> right? I mean, it's so weird to think in New York, three hours ago, the ball fell, and it's 9 o'clock at home, and we're thinking, wow, this is kind of weird. It's just a day on the calendar. I'm glad that we have it. 
It gives us an opportunity to make a reason to start fresh. But wouldn't you want your reason to start fresh this morning to be based upon more than that? On a calendar? Wouldn't you want your reason to start fresh this morning be more along the lines that I can do better. I can commit myself more. And the depth of my commitment that I'm making this morning to the Lord, I'm making that commitment based on the work that he's done on my behalf. I'm making that commitment knowing that he's already laid the path for me. All I have to do is put my eyes on him. All I have to do is begin to move that direction and to not get strayed away on other side paths, if you will. The Lord never goes back on his word. He never breaks his commitment to us. I will never leave you, he said. I will never forsake you. Maybe you're here this morning in your Christian life this year really stunk. Maybe it was filled with nothing but uh, all over the place. Well, I want you to think about something. Even some of the greatest men of God throughout history have failed. And they failed miserably. Take our friend Peter, for instance. Look what happened to Peter. He denied the Lord. I mean, we all get caught up if we say a, a cuss word or something. Oh, my God, Jesus doesn't love me anymore. Peter denied that he even knew the Lord. You know, Judas did the same thing. He denied the Lord. He betrayed the Lord. Peter got so angry that the Bible says he was swearing at them. I wonder how Peter felt when he walked away from that. It was during that time when he said, you know what, guys? I'm done with this. I'm just going fishing. I'm going to get back in the boat, and I'm going to go do what I know how to do, and that's fish. And a lot of times we do the same thing. I'm going back to the world, and I'm going to know what I know how to do, and that's live in the world and walk away from the Lord. I'll tell you this morning for sure, because we know what happened with Peter, and the same thing's going to happen with us too. Because once you're a child of God, you have been bought and paid for. You have been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus, and you cannot just flippantly turn it on and turn it off. It's forever. If you're truly born again, you are forever his child. Now, you may be a rebellious, disobedient little brat. <laughs> yeah, and you may have some hand marks across your rear end. Even as Peter, the Lord seems to always draw us back. It wasn't with perishable things that we were purchased like gold and silver. It wasn't with traditions that we were purchased, but it was with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. And it wasn't plan B, you guys. It was to be this way from the very, very beginning. First Peter 1 says that he chose, that he chose Jesus before the creation of the world, but revealed him in these last times for your sake. And it's through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so our faith today and our hope is in God. There's a couple of things that commitments to Jesus that he wants to help us with this morning. Because I know as we look forward and we're looking at the world and events and our own country and our own economy and the uncertainty of tomorrow, I know that it's really easy to feel a sense of anxiety. I struggle with the same things. But the closer I find myself drawing to the Lord, the more I'm holding on tight and believing in Him, the more He's helping us with this anxiety the more he's helping us with worry. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all of your anxiety or all of your cares on him because he cares for you. 
He has big enough shoulders to carry that. Psalm 23, 44 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that's the other thing that commitment to God will bring us is comfort. Less anxiety, less worry, comfort in our hearts, knowing he's going to help me in my difficulties going forward, no matter what the future holds. Oh, I'd love to stand up here and tell you all, it's going to be a great year. I'm going to tell you, that we're, God's just saying, hey, day by day, you guys, trust me, walk with me. Sure, Peter's, Peter's faith did, uh, he did fail the Lord. But he came back. And God used him in a mighty, powerful way. Point is, perhaps some of us have done the same thing. But God's not done with you yet. Jesus is praying for you to the Father he told Peter, he said, Satan's tried to have you, Peter. He's trying to sift you like wheat. He said, but I have prayed for you. Can you imagine that? Jesus is praying for you? He's making intercession to the Father on your behalf during those difficult times? You know, he laid down his life for us when he was... Overlooking Jerusalem in Matthew 23, he says, O Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. I've heard stories of hens gathering their chicks under their wings as a Vulture or whatever, hawk is flying overhead. And that bird will come down and try to attack those chicks as it's hiding under the, the mother's wings. And they will peck at her and they will hit her and they will try to take her life and destroy her. And she will stay there until the death to protect them. That's why Jesus is saying this. He knows what he's talking about when he uses this example. He said, but you would not. You would not allow it. He laid down his life for the chicks. He laid down his life for you and me. He wants to cover us with his wings to protect us from the one who would separate us from him. His commitment to you this morning, it even extends beyond life on this earth. It extends into eternal, everlasting life beyond the grave. Something that I don't think we're really able to fathom in our minds, in the natural mind. But if we focus our commitment to him and his commitment to us, we'll grow deeper. We'll go deeper as individuals and families and as a church. People, you know, say, I wonder what ever happened to the great revivals. Why isn't there any revival why aren't people just flocking into churches because the world's in such a mess? Why aren't they turning to God? Well, part of it's our fault. Part of it's our fault because we don't want to get involved. We don't want to take the risk. We don't want to tell them who we are. And I think that's really important for us this year, moving into a new year, that we, we, we seek out that a surety in our own hearts of who we are so that we can tell people about it. I don't know much about the Bible, Pastor. I wouldn't know what scriptures to use to tell somebody about that. No, you might not. But you have a story. You have a testimony. And people listen to that stuff. When they're down and out and they're hurting and they have no hope and they're empty inside and you tell them, I know, because I was there. And that, well, how did you get from there to where you're at? Let me tell you how. That God would give us the boldness and the love for people around us. 
Because God showed his love to you and me in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Aren't you glad that he didn't tell you to go clean up your act? (laughs) Go get yourself right before you come to the cross. Well, that would totally take away the meaning of the cross. So as we move into a, a brand new year, I want to encourage you. Our commitment to the Lord is more important than ever. As we see things rapidly changing around us, stability is what God is asking from us. That we not be conformed to the world, but we allow him to continue to change us. I'm going to have the worship team, the boy band, come on up. (coughs) And I want to thank you guys for a wonderful 2022 with you. Um, You're an awesome church. I love pastoring you. And I'm very much looking forward to what God's going to continue to do here. Are we giving away food? Are we giving out food? Yes. Yes. What, Glenn? Oh, yes. Um, Because we weren't able to get together last Friday, uh, a week ago, Friday, we have these bags over here for homeless, for anybody that might be in need. And so if you would like to take one of those with you today, please do. And, uh, you know, I grab a couple and I just put them in my car. And as I'm driving around, it's, it's a very great opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, help somebody who's in need. Um, there's some very valuable, helpful things in each one of those bags. So if you'd like to be part of that, I would appreciate it. I didn't hear you. I got it. She thought I was going to forget. It's a good secretary. All right, um, so I'm going to close this in prayer. And uh, let me encourage you this morning, because it is New Year's Day, maybe some of you are feeling the need to maybe refresh your commitment today. Maybe you'd like to just get off on the right foot, so to speak. Maybe you would like to get together with Lonnie and Chris over here and just pray together with them. I would encourage you to take the time to do that while you're here. Even while we're singing these last two songs, you can get up and go on over there and get some prayer. And as I close this morning, there's a few people that I want to pray for. Um, You all know Linda and Brian Haslin um, and Charlotte's husband, Vern. They're having some serious health issues going on. Um, So I want to take a moment and pray for them also. So let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks. Lord, that again, a new beginning, a fresh start. And Lord, I just pray that we would just focus our commitment to you. Lord, that we would lay our burdens down at your feet truly. Help us, Lord. Lord, it just seems like sometimes we feel like we're trying and we get weary and those fears and anxieties creep in again. But God, Holy Spirit, give us the strength and the power to overcome. Give us the faith to know that we're part of a much bigger thing, that we're part of your kingdom, and it's eternal and it's forever. And Lord, because of your love for us, we know that we can bring our loved ones to you. So we want to bring Linda and Brian before you today. And just ask, Lord, that you would touch their body, Lord, that you would be with them uh, after surgery and rehabs and uh, with Charlotte's husband, Vern, Lord, with the medical problems that he's going through right now. Just be with these families, these precious people, God, and let them know of a surety that you're there with them in their midst. Lord, we look forward to a new year with you, We look forward to the things that you're going to do through us and in us at this church. So I would pray blessing upon us right now. I would ask you, Lord, to bless each and every family and individual in here this morning, those who are listening online, those who couldn't be here today. God, be with us. Help us keep our perspective right, our eyes upon you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.